Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here, assuming things are going to go great. I will welcome Mr. Francisco Aguilar, the CEO of Bounce Imaging. Uh, Pennsylvania, but close enough. <laughs> Uh, and the topic of the presentation is going to be bounce, bounce, recce. How how would you pronounce that? Recce, yeah. So bounce recce 360 thermal integration. So quick reminder: we'll do 10 minutes, and we're going to time that offline without the virtual timer. So Francisco, you'll hear a little bell when the 10 minutes are up. It'll be kind of just finish up there, and then 10 minute okay. Q and A that we'll moderate. So. We'll Great. go ahead and hand it over to you when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all very much for having the flexibility to keep this going. Uh, and despite the current madness, we really appreciate uh, that you were able to find a way to make this work. So thank you. Great. All right. Um, so I guess I will audibly, if you can advance to the, the first slide, please. Okay, so I don't think I need to... Uh, Explain to anyone what these soldiers must be feeling looking down into this uh, this tunnel system in Afghanistan, and the fear and anxiety associated with knowing that to complete your mission, you're going to have to go down into that space. Um, it's something uh, that we can, I think, all empathize with. And I think the two takeaways that I want from uh, that I want you to take away from this this uh, conversation is first that the technology we're going to show you is real in the world technology that is making a difference for people right now, uh, our civilian and special operations partners telling us saving lives today, um, at the core base technology that we're working from. And second, that we have an opportunity through this X-Tech search process to add capabilities and technologies to vastly expand the range of use cases in which this can be applied, um, and thus to keep that many more um, both civilian and war fighters safer in very complex and difficult environments. So we, we really appreciate the opportunity to be talking to you about this today. So what is it that I'm talking about? Um, next slide, please. Uh, I think, okay. Well, I think our slides are a little bit different. That's all right. We will work with it. So yeah, so what we, what we do, uh, the, the reality is that there's technologies out there in the world that should help in these environments. So you might think of robots and drones and all sorts of uh, fancy tech that you tend to see in these, uh, in these uh, spaces. The reality is that they don't usually get used and they're not very effective because they're quite expensive. They're very hard to use. They're difficult to carry and they often have a limited field of view. And so it's very difficult to understand the world when you're looking through, through those spaces. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So what we do is this. It's a throwable omnidirectional camera system, something that you can toss into a space and instantly get a 360 degree view for multiple users right on their devices of what's going on so they can have total situational awareness oriented such that they know which way is forward and therefore be much safer in complex and dangerous environments. Next slide, please. Okay, sorry, something's happened. The first uh, video was supposed to play uh, the police use of this. So I wonder if we can go back and show that video. You, got, you are now getting to see the canine use case, which is when we mounted on a dog, a traditional camera. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm rolling with it. So it's good, it's good. What will get pulled up will be uh, how uh, our civilian partners in law enforcement, which was our first market, use this to stay safer as they uh, deal with a whole range of environments. So hopefully that will pop up shortly. All right, that's unfortunate, but that's okay. All right. The main idea, this is something you can toss into a room. When you toss it into a room on your phone or on your tablet, you get a 360 degree view of what's going on and you can spin around, have multiple people look in all directions and see what's going on in the spaces. You can throw this through a window, deploy it on a pole, use it on a rope. Um, 
and it's deployed with hundreds of police departments, uh, SWAT teams across the country, and uh, recently it's been starting to be deployed with special operations team on the DOD side. Um, next slide, please. All right, forgot it. Okay, so uh, this will give you a sense of the stabilization. This is a traditional canine camera, something you would mount on the back of a dog, and you can see it's shaky, it's a mess. The same idea as when you have it in a throwable camera. And when you put this on a dog, uh, same as when you throw it through a window, no matter how that dog spins around or turns or goes in different directions, um, you always maintain your orientation and you know which way you're looking, no matter what the motion. And then you can look around in all directions in 360. So you can imagine even this, when this isn't mounted on a dog, throwing it through a window, that you can get this complete view and therefore avoid some very clear risks. You can probably skip to the next. Uh, to the next bit. Okay, so the core technology behind this, um, as you will see on the on the video, is uh, twofold. First, it's very advanced uh, stitching software that is noise resistant about 200 times faster than traditional methods. So it is much less processor hungry and it doesn't get uh, uh, tripped up when you break a lens or when you're in uh, dust and dirt. And then second, this stabilization piece, which you see uh, as we throw this camera off of, uh, of Bixby Bridge out on Highway 1, um, that maintains your orientation regardless of the movement of the device. So that requires a mix of both uh, advanced software and a hardware uh, that synchronizes things perfectly. You can go to the next slide, please. This is a, a demonstration of the same effect on the horizontal level. So when we work, for example, in subterraneous operations, when you put this on a rope, you always maintain your orientation, even as the camera is spinning uh, around in all directions. All right, next, please. Okay, so um, as I was saying, this has been used uh, a lot across law enforcement, search and rescue, a whole bunch of different uh, places. But as we talk more and more to our DOD users, the most requested improvement is to add a thermal capability to the cameras. And the reason for this is that we currently work in the near infrared, we light up rooms with 130 watts of IR flash, and that works well, works quite well in law enforcement context. But increasingly, as we work in night operations in the DOD context, that interferes with night vision goggles that are being used by our users. And there's certain environments in which you don't want to have any visible uh, footprint at all. And so uh, the, the neat thing about our stitching technology is that it, because it is noise resistant, because it doesn't rely on matching two images together, it can deal with a very noisy environment of thermal. And so you can do the very same thing that you've seen done in the visual and be applied to thermal. And so it's a very nice example of a, of a technical challenge where the theory is very clear and very straightforward, but there's a very uh, direct engineering channel challenge that has to be overcome. And so there's a great opportunity for something like x -Tech Search, where you can help bring a technology that you understand in, in concept into application and directly into um, uh, field use for, for uh, warfighters. On the next slide, in terms of, uh, sorry, did this I'm not, didn't actually impact to the, the, my slide hasn't advanced. Can someone read the headline for me? Oh, perfect. Now I did it. Now I did it. Sorry about that. <laughs> Apologies, and, and thank you for your patience with, with what are clearly some technical issues. Okay, so impact to the Army. We just did a, uh, a trial deployment of a few of these cameras with Ranger Regiment in Afghanistan. And the message that we got back from them was that using our cameras in their current format, they came, they knew, they could identify clearly situations in which they had taken casualties on prior deployment in which they did not take casualties because they had our technology in place. Um, that is enormous for us. That is what we live for. Um, and the fact that this is being, you know, this in its current format can make a difference is really important to us. But what we also heard was that uh, because of the IR signature, it was mostly used in daytime operations, and that teams wanted to have that capability to use it at night, and that therefore, if they had this thermal integration, they could uh, use it in many more 
use cases and therefore keep themselves safe in many more situations. So that's the kind of impact that we're talking about. And when they talk to us, they're saying, we want this at the squad level deployment. We want this every team to be able, before they go into a tunnel, before they go into a house, before they go um, over a ridge, they want to be able to, to get this technology. Next slide, please. We are deployed all over the world on the civilian sector, law enforcement, uh, and uh, safety applications. Next slide, please. Uh, and our team has decades of experience in advanced imaging, advanced hardware, um, working across software and machine learning. Uh, so quite just the exact skill set that you'd want, as well as people who've actually been deployed and understand what it is like to work in the Army. Next slide. And I think we're out of time. So apologies that the video didn't play quite as we wanted, but uh, thank you for your patience with tech uh, headaches. And, and please let us know if you have any questions that we can, that we can answer. Great. Francisco, thanks so much. Great presentation there. Definitely got some good questions mm -hmm. come through. Uh, we'll get started here. I think the, the first one, um, could you describe a little bit more about the <clears throat> the sensor and processing hardware, I guess? You, you haven't developed a thermal imaging one yet, but for the, the existing application, do you develop your own you know, proprietary processing hardware yeah. or sensors for cameras, or do you take it off the shelf and integrate it? We, we use the, the image sensors are pretty standard uh, Omnivision Aptina type sensors. And the, the key trick is that it's not one, it's not six cameras, it's one six-eyed camera. So it's basically six sensors multiplexed together uh, at the clock level and tying that to IMUs such that everything is precisely coming in at the same time. And then very rapid stitching that uses um, a very precise calibration in a, in a 3D context to take the pixels from those images and reproject them into a panorama that then you can rotate um, and stitch together very quickly. Um, traditional image, image stitching says, here I've got one picture, here about another, let me try to find some common features and join them. That's very computationally intensive and it breaks down when you have things like noise um, that confuse those matches. Because we don't have those things because we're so much faster, we can deal not only with very low processors and very complex imaging environments, but we can also work in other spectra like in thermal. So is that done in the camera that you throw in, or is that in a processor that's outside? Yeah, exactly. This is done on the camera, right? That's the neat trick of having that efficiency. So you don't need any other infrastructure. Just this device can give you that and send it back to an ATAC device, send it back to a, a tablet, send it back to a phone, and in real time with very low latency because of that processing advantage. Exactly right. Yeah. And how much battery power is that going to take? You know, how big are batteries? Can you swap the batteries out? Uh, we don't currently stop them out, but these things will give you about four or five hours of runtime without the IR flash on, and they'll give you about two and a half with the flash on. We have a smaller version of these things, too, that gives you about 90 minutes, and that's for special operations users that want to have many so they can throw them in different environments at once. But the, the, just the duration depends a bit on, on how many you want to carry, but, uh, but it's a pretty good uh, duration because, as, uh, to your point, the lower power draw of a more efficient stitching process. Okay, and on that note then, for the IR load, for the, the infrared imaging versus near infrared, how much mm -hmm. more of a processor load is there required? So the processor load is actually about the same because you are, uh, because the key is in the sort of the reprojection of pixels rather than in the uh, matching and processing. If you did traditional processing, it would be immensely more complicated and immensely more processor intensive because you don't have to do that. It's very comparable. At the two devices, what do those weigh? This thing weighs 1.6 pounds. This thing weighs uh, 0.8 pounds. We've dropped this thing off drones onto rooftops. It's it's pretty light. I have one other question. What's what's the lower limit? How much smaller could you get than that yeah. that smaller form factor there? Say say you wanted like a 20 minute battery, right? Just one single user disposable. Yeah. Uh, how small could you make it? You can keep getting smaller than this. Each time it gets more complicated. This was a, a pretty complicated effort to get down to this size from this size. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's no there's no real theoretical limit to how, well, there are clearly theoretical limits. There's no uh, practical limit to how small you can, you can get this down to say like a golf ball size. But everything is a question of time, energy, uh, and cost. We're always trading off part of what our advantage is that we make these things quite low cost. So that if you throw them into an environment and it's too dangerous to get it back, 
not worth someone risking someone's safety to go and get it. Um, so there's the, the, those are the key trade-offs that keep us at a certain size, but you can always go smaller. It's just a, a technical challenge. And as you said, reduce the battery. Cool. Um, n next question, tell us a little bit more about the, the wireless communications protocols. Is that, have you developed any proprietary stuff there? Is it Wi-Fi? Um, any, anything you can share there on, on how yeah. to be protected? We, we go over three, we, we have three ways to transmit the information at the moment. The first is uh, we create our own wireless Wi-Fi hotspot that can that is encrypted, 256 AES encrypted, the data and the, the channel. Um, we can also go over 4G, so either in civilian context or for uh, DoD users that can create their for, own 4G networks, we can go over 4G. And then finally, with the support of the Air Force, we're in the process of integrating Trellisware, so a man A network. Um, but that integration has allowed us to integrate other systems. So if we wanted to plug into, say, persistent systems or Silvis or any of those, um, but it's a much easier path now that we've been able that we've done this work to integrate Trellisware. So it can basically hook up to your radios currently and to other radio systems in the future. Have you already developed sort of because we actually have a few companies, Next Tech, Search Three, that are developing like anti-jamming, counter-jamming technology. Is that is that already built in, or is that something you'd have to work on in the future? The main the main advantage to that, and actually we've heard this recently from some of our um, uh, DOD users that want to take us to some demonstrations. The fact that you have multiple channels means that if you're being jammed on one frequency, you can operate on a different frequency, and that's one on a completely different frequency in the same device. And that's what they found as an interesting way to get around jamming. We don't have a specific anti-jamming uh, technology built in, but the fact that you can hop to a totally different spectrum um, means that it's much harder to block you. That's transmitting. Now, what about the viewing device? How big is that? Can you, get, can you view it on a digital notepad? You know, yep, absolutely. So this is a, a really big iPad. That's kind of the higher limit. Um, then you've got, you know, something size of a phone that can just plug into that and use that. It's just an app, same as ATAC, um, that just can be strapped to your wrist and something you can look on quickly. Or if you're at a command center, you can look on a big screen um, and see in much more detail. Encryption is, a, is the signal encrypted that's being sent? Yeah. It's 256 AES encrypted, and we're also at the request of users. There's no data stored on these devices. So even if the device is compromised, you can't get the, the video feed from it. Got it. I have one more question here. Um, come, the last one here, since we're almost out of time, is around this, the stitching. So it sounds like that's kind of your secret sauce, is how to stitch these things mm -hmm. together with the high processing power. One, kind of like, what's the origin story on that? Does this come out of like some fundamental research, or is this something you stumbled upon working on it nights and weekends? And then secondly, what's the dual use application for that? Have you explored licensing this to existing manufacturers? Yep. Or commercial use cases? Yeah, to start with the second one, um, we are in fact looking at a bunch of different ways to use the same stitching. So you saw the dog camera. That's a, a, a clear example of where you can take a different form factor and apply the same thing. But we've been asked to look at it for vehicles, for uh, drones, for robots, because indeed, if you've got fixed camera positions, you can take advantage of these uh, processor and stabilization improvements in a bunch of different form factors. And then in terms of the, the source, the, the K, the, U, the case it came from, we were looking at this. We were looking at uh, the Haiti earthquake and trying to figure out how you could get low cost technology into dangerous environments. And we got outreach from police departments and from um, uh, search and rescue users who wanted to say, I need to look inside these spaces and I don't have much and I can't afford the $50,000 camera. And so we started with a need and then we figured out what the tech technology we're going to have to build in order to develop that. And we naively thought we could just take off the shelf stitching processes and do it. It turned out that nothing in existence had the, the duration and the low processing requirement to make something that was really effective, usable, cheap, uh, could work in infrared, could work in bad environments. So the need drove the technology rather than sort of technology looking for a use. That's the way to do it. Great thing to yeah. end on. So Nice job in presentation. Thank yep. you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry again for the tech issues. We don't know why yeah. that happened. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, we're still still working through it here. So, um, so again, thanks to Francisco from Bounce Imaging for that great presentation Q and A.